Economic growth between Ireland and Canada is dependent on trade agreements supported by policies, one of which is housing. I'm Jackie Gillen, the chair of the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce and the newly minted Ireland Canada Business Council. When considering expanding operations to a foreign jurisdiction, property and location are key considerations. And today we look at Irish and Canadian housing policies. Arguably, challenges faced by many countries are not only due to the pandemic, logistics and the supply chain issues, but are also a result of inaction by many governments on all sides over decades as one or another transitioned in and out of power. To start us off today, Canada's Ambassador to Ireland, Her Excellency Nancy Smythe, joins us from Dublin. Ambassador, it's great to welcome you again today. I'll hand it over to you. Good morning. Thanks, Jackie. And much appreciation to Minister O'Brien also for participating in this event today. It's great to be able to speak to you and to your audience today. And I really appreciate this invitation to be a part of the event. Aussi, je voudrais d'entrée de feu féliciter la Chambre de Commerce Irlande Canada et le Conseil des entreprises Irlande Canada pour l'organisation de cet événement aussi pertinent qu'opportun. It's been almost 60 years since the right to housing was recognized by the global community of states in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights as a component of the right to an adequate standard of living. Yet that the full realization of that human right remains elusive in far too many countries, including our own as economic, demographic, regulatory, migratory and other social factors combine to challenge the ability of our private and our public sectors to ensure a home for all. On sait aussi que le développement économique est un élément clé de rehaussement de niveau de vie de la population et que la crise de logement constitue un frein important à l'activité économique. C'est très simple. Si le logement n'est pas là, À un prix raisonnable, impossible de recruter de meilleures personnes et faire grandir ces opérations. So if employers cannot effectively recruit because of housing considerations, this will limit the ability of trading nations like Ireland and like Canada to deepen the global commercial relationships that are the cornerstone of our future prosperity. Lack of housing also limits the leeway available to countries to play their role internationally in taking in those seeking asylum from armed conflict, discrimination, or national disaster. Ireland has welcomed tens of thousands of Ukrainians in an impressive show of solidarity and generosity. And Canada is also known for its leadership in taking in refugees and asylees. A lack of housing capacity brings challenges, as we know, to these humanitarian efforts as well. And finally, Ireland and Canada, we share aligned climate targets and goals and ensuring that buildings we construct and live in have smaller carbon footprints is essential to meeting our targets. The construction sectors in Canada and in Ireland are already working together towards achieving this with greener buildings, construction and building retrofitting. Plans such as Ireland's National Retrofit Plan, which aims to complete energy upgrades on 500,000 homes by 2030, and Canada's Green Homes Initiative are examples of how the building sector, including residential, has a role to play in achieving climate goals. These will also provide new opportunities to suppliers and to service providers, including your own membership working towards greener building. The construction and building industries in Ireland and Canada can also benefit from the Canada-Europe trade agreement, which eliminates tariffs on the majority of originating products used in building and maintaining construction. Through CETA, as we call the agreement, Irish and Canadian construction companies can also benefit from improved labour mobility provisions and expanded access to government procurement opportunities. En bref, la question du logement est un, est un qui touche tous les sphères de la société canadienne, irlandaise et mondiale. Voilà pourquoi la nomination en automne dernier de l'honorable Ahmed Hussein au nouveau rôle de ministre du logement pour diriger l'action fédérale en ce domaine est un développement si important. It's really my thrill to introduce Minister Hussein, who was elected first in 2015 to represent Ontario uh, at the riding of York Southwestern. He worked on housing 
This work on housing is notably informed by his previous roles as Minister of Families, Children, Social Development, as well as his role as Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Minister Hussein also brings considerable personal experience to the table from his career before politics. As you may know, he was an immigrant to Canada, worked in social services and as a community advocate and well known for his role that uh, serving as president of the Canadian Somali Congress. As a lawyer, he focused on criminal defense, immigration, refugee law and human rights. I'm very pleased that ICOD has chosen this topic and that he's invited Irish and Canadian ministerial leadership to discuss some of these challenges, their impacts and what solutions need to be on the agenda in order to bring about a more efficient and more affordable and a greener housing market for all. And with that, I turn to Minister Hussein. Merci encore, uh, Jackie, pour uh, l'occasion aujourd'hui. Thank you, Ambassador Smythe. Before we go over to Minister Hussein, as you mentioned, the aligned climate goals you speak of have resulted in Canada and Ireland working together for greener bills and certainly with seat and the removal of certain construction tariffs. Uh, this will benefit both of our countries. And now with your introduction to our next guest, Minister Ahmed Hussein, we'll head back to Canada's national capital, Oshawa. Minister Hussein, thank you for joining us today. Can you share with us some high level highlights of the policy and programs to increase Canada's housing stock? Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you so much Ambassador Smythe for your kind words. And Jackie, it is great to see you. And thank you everyone for including me in this important event. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure to meet, my name is Ahmed Hussein, Canada's Minister for Housing and Diversity and Inclusion. The Canada-Ireland Business Council and the Canada-Ireland Chamber of Commerce is all about making sure that our two countries' commercial and trade and investment opportunities are strengthened. You are working every single day to make sure that you increase prosperity and jobs for both the people of Ireland and Canada. But you also understand through today's conversations that central to that is access to safe and affordable housing that meets the needs of both Canadians, newcomers and Irish people. And that is why our government understands the importance of that by introducing the National Housing Strategy in 2017, a $72 billion program to ensure that every Canadian has access to a safe and affordable place to call home. But we're not stopping there. In budget 2022, we're investing an additional $14 billion to make sure that we continue the progress that is necessary to ensure access to affordable housing for everyone. We know that we can't do it alone. That is why partnerships across the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and even internationally with our allies, such as Ireland, is important to make sure that we're all working towards the same goal of solving the housing challenges faced by both Canadians and Irish people, as well as many other people around the world. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for increasing our prosperity and working every single day, not only to increase the commercial ties between the two countries and peoples, but the strong people to people ties between Canada and Ireland. Thank you for everything that you do. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you, Minister. Hopefully next time there is more time available to dive a bit deeper for our audience. Be well. We are now joined by Ireland's Ambassador to Canada, His Excellency Dr. Eamon McKee. Ambassador, once again, it's great to have you with us. I'll send it straight over to you. Thanks, Jackie. It's my pleasure and honour to be involved in another great event organised by ICOT uh, on behalf of the Irish uh, Canada Business Council. Indeed, I'd like to thank you, Jackie, for everything that you've done over the last 10 years. Uh, you really brought your leadership, vision and dynamism uh, to the council here in Ottawa. And I thank you for that. I wish you well for your future plans. I know you'll be busy, um, but you certainly made an impact here and we really appreciate it. You know, the council is right to consider housing as an issue uh, that is very important to business and our ambitions in terms of uh, Irish economic growth over the next uh, period ahead. Housing has been a key issue since the foundation of the state um, and indeed uh, successive Irish governments uh, led on public housing in the 1920s and 30s. The pressure on housing and the housing stock in Ireland was eased by immigration, um, but the success of the Irish economy over the last 20 years has meant that our population is rising, as is our workforce. Um, and the need for housing is now acute. It's been addressed as a priority by the Taoiseach um, uh, for the next 10 years. Um, and as part of our discussions today, 
I'm delighted to introduce Minister Daryl O'Brien, uh, who has crafted and launched a Housing for All policy, uh, which will take us to 2030. Uh, housing is not just an issue about uh, shelter of our citizens, uh, it's about our economic prosperity, not only for our domestic workforce, but also for the talent that Ireland attracts because of the strength of its foreign direct investment sector. There is no doubt that solving this issue is going to be a key to our future and a key to our economic growth. Uh, I know the discussions are going to be really interesting uh, between Minister Darrell O'Brien and his Canadian counterpart, counterpart here, uh, Minister Hussein. So uh, thanks again, Jackie, for everything you've done. Uh, looking forward to a great discussion. Uh, take care, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ambassador McKee. Jackie, it's really great to speak to the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce Ottawa and indeed the Ireland Canada Business Council viewers here today. In these times of division and strife, it's really important to reinforce our relationship with our friends and trusted partners at every single opportunity. The Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce Ottawa uh, does really vital work in promoting bilateral trade between our two countries and importantly facilitating access to a broad cross-section of relevant contacts. I'm also really excited to see the good work the newly incorporated Irish Canada Business Council will do. But also alongside uh, that vital work uh, of cultivating business and trade links between our two nations, ICOT also includes programs with fo which focus on sports and culture and education and really in their importance to economic growth. Just as housing is an integral part to almost every sector in society, businesses must also, also ensure that they're in close proximity to and supportive of cultural and recreational pursuits. Since the shift in the working world caused by the pandemic, it's not solely the quality of the job or quality of housing that attracts and motivated and well-educated workers, but the quality of life um, to ensure there's ample high quality housing that is the foundation of both economic prosperity and a happy and fulfilled life, our government introduced the Housing for All plan, which is to build 300,000 new homes over the next decade. Uh, we're just a year into the plan now, and that provides us with the opportunity to reflect on the many things that have worked and the very occasional uh, thing that didn't. Uh, when we look back at the progress that's been made, uh, it's really clear the plan is working and we're fulfilling the vision of achieving, uh, excuse me, housing for all. And housing for all represents the most ambitious housing plan in the history of our state. As we know, a significant contributing factor is that of supply. And this government is committed to building an average of 33,000 homes a year over the lifetime of the plan. Increasing supply is the key focus of the plan, be it social or affordable housing, one bedroom apartments, duplexes, family homes and everything in between. Housing for all envisages an Ireland where everyone's housing needs are catered for. And although the plan is detailed and it's comprehensive and specific, it's only the beginning of what has to be a multi-year approach to solving the crisis. Our plan is supported by historic levels of investment with annual exchequer funding standing at an average of 4 billion euro per year over the next five years. And this commitment does and will give the industry the certainty and stability to produce the supply we need. We're targeting 24,600 new homes this year, comprising of over 4,000 affordable, 9,000 social, and 11,500 private ownership and private rental homes. But to achieve these ambitious targets will require enormous effort. But progress is already evident, and only one year into a nine-year plan. COVID-19 and the lockdowns associated with it have understandably hampered the industry, but bounce back has been promising and the strong pipeline of home building activity is actually very encouraging. In terms of general progress in the past 12 months, that's from August 21 to July 2022, commencement notices for the construction of over 28,000 homes were received. New home completions over the past year uh, to June this year, stood at just short of 25,000. And this exceeds our 2022 target uh, and shows the progress being made as a result of housing for all. Over the 12 months from April 21 to March 22, planning permissions were granted for over 44,000 residential units. 
and we're actively ensuring that the homes being built are becoming homes for people up and down the country. In May of this of last year, excuse me, my department issued guidelines which were aimed at preventing multiple houses and duplexes being sold to a single buyer. And recent analysis of these guidelines show that 16,000 residential units have been ring fenced for individual buyers. Increased home ownership is one of the key pillars of housing for all. And with that, providing affordable homes for real people is one of my government's top priorities. Despite this, the data also points to continuing challenges and not least that of inflation. Supply chain issues as a result of the pandemic and Brexit and spikes in demand are putting pressure on costs and the supply of certain materials. We can expect further house price inflation in the short term as the global econ economy excuse me, recovers and supply levels rebalance. Narrowing the gap between supply and demand through the implementation of housing for all will ultimately result in a moderation of prices and provide greater certainty to buyers and the sector alike. To ensure that our targets are met, the government has committed through Housing for All to reducing residential construction costs. An analysis that has been carried out by the Society of Chartered Surveyors here in Ireland indicates that construction bill costs account for about 40%, 47% of the total apartment development costs. Challenges do also exist in other parts of the housing sector and the increase in homelessness seen in recent months is of serious concern to government. The issue is being actively addressed and the delivery of social housing is being prioritised to address this problem. We're very much focused on accelerating social housing supply and a target to deliver 9,000 new build social homes this year. Recent changes I made with the housing assistance payment will help secure more tenancies and prevent households from slipping into homelessness. Further reforms though of the housing market are also needed that we can ensure that supply keeps pace with demand. And the government is reviewing right now and modernizing the planning system and implementing actions to increase capacity and innovation and indeed productivity in the construction sector. In relation to increasing home ownership, something that I firmly believe in, in the immediate term, housing for all is a plan for everyone and addresses social, affordable and private housing provision. The government is committed to increasing home ownership and uh, numerous schemes have been uh, introduced to help buyers realise their dream of owning their own home. Very significantly, the first home scheme, which I launched in July, will support the purchase of up to 1,700 affordable homes this year um, and the substantial financial commitment of 400 million euro by government to the scheme shows the determination to increase home ownership uh, is much more than an empty slogan, but is a real policy initiative that's taking hold now. Earlier this year, the Enhanced Local Authority Home Loan was launched, which again is aimed at first-time buyers and low and moderate incomes who are unable to secure a mortgage and the mortgage that they need from a financial lending institution. A big area of addressing vacancy and dereliction is also a pressing concern for government and we have taken steps already uh, to tackle the problem around the country. Local authorities already delivering the recently launched Creek Honaha Towns Fund, which provides grants to support people refurbishing vacant properties. And these grants are up to 50,000 euro. This will encourage people to live in our small towns and villages in a sustainable way. Government launched the Town Centre First policy in February. Again, that aims to help tackle vacancy and combat dereliction, and importantly, to breathe new life into our town centres across the country. Alongside other home ownership supports, these are the schemes that are available now and will help secure homes for those who need them in the immediate term. Addressing issues in the rental market is also vitally important to ensure that both employees and employers have somewhere affordable and secure to live that is close to amenities and to businesses. In Housing for All, we're again focused on tackling supply and affordability issues in the rental market. The plan contains targets, actions and guaranteed state investment, as I said earlier, of over 4 billion a year uh, directly to housing aimed at increasing supply, which in turn will help 
increase access to affordable rental housing. In the short term, I've strengthened renters' rights with tenancies of unlimited duration. We've also passed legislation to cap rent increases at a maximum of 2% in rent pressure zones, zones excuse me, where general inflation is higher. Uh, supply is absolutely key, and thankfully it's increasing. But as well as tackling pressures in the rental market in the short term, our plan also addresses the issue of longer term supply needs. Housing for All sets a target of 9,000 new built social homes this year, but increasing our social housing stock will reduce the demand on our private rental sector as we currently rely too much on our rental market to house those on social housing waiting lists. As we've committed to in Housing for All, the first affordable cost rental homes are now beginning to come into the market, some of which would advertise at rates of up to 50% lower than market rents. Cost rental is a state-backed form of tenure aimed at middle-income households where the price of rent is equal to the cost of both building, managing and maintaining the home uh, only over the term of a set period, usually set at about 40 years. This means prices are not driven by the markets, uh, making it more affordable and it's not profit driven. And already this year, we've hundreds of cost rental homes tenanted in less than 12 months. It didn't exist a year ago since the passing of the Affordable Housing Act last July. And this has facilitated this form of rental tenure, which has become very popular. And to ensure that supply ramps up to meet the scale we need to provide housing for all, we must also increase the number of people employed, as well as the productivity of the construction sector itself. These long-term policies will result in a sustained level of housing output that will ensure the housing question is answered once and for all. On the construction sector, uh, my colleague Tanish de Leo Varadkar recently announced funding of €5 million Euro over five years for the establishment of a construction technology centre. And this centre will accelerate research and innovation within the construction and built environment sector. The technology centre will be hosted by NUI Galway, Old School Nagalava, and the consortium includes our top class universities of Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin and University College Cork, working with the Irish Green Building Council. This new construction technology centre will also prioritise residential construction through a number of initiatives, such as putting in place structures and funding that will enable this much needed innovation. And this will be done by promoting, developing and indeed supporting innovation, such as really importantly, modern methods of construction. The centre will also provide support for small and medium enterprises uh, to help them develop scale and to adopt those modern methods of construction, particularly for residential uh, development. It will also support digitisation in the manufacturing sector uh, for residential construction. Uh, the department, as I mentioned, uh, of Enterprise Trade and Employment, supported by my own department, have established a Modern Methods of Construction uh, Leadership and, in, and Integration Group. And this group will support development of the MMC to ensure its adoption and improve innovation in the construction industry with a particular focus, as I've said earlier on, on residential construction. Our construction sector group, uh, facilitated by my own Department of Housing, has appointed a consultant to carry out analysis of each component of cost construction and co construction of houses in particular and apartments. Uh, this is being done with a view to reducing costs, including the cost of compliance and increasing standardization, which will drive efficiencies. It will also identify opportunities for cost reduction uh, for consideration by relevant government departments and indeed the industry themselves. Investing in housing, increasing supply of homes, and ensuring employment in the construction sector is, is a top priority uh, for this government. To deliver the housing output required, the government estimates that the numbers of construction workers involved in uh, residential uh, construction and development will need to rise by about 27, from 27,000, or excuse me, by 27,500 workers to just under 68,000 by the middle of the decade and possibly up to 80,000 to address the backlog of housing output uh, that has built up over 10 years of undersupply. 
The signs are positive so far and show that the construction industry is expanding. And recent data released show that over 167,000 people now work in construction, 20,000 more than pre-pandemic levels, and 40,000 more than this time last year. And to alleviate the continued shortages in the construction sector, we've expanded work permits to encourage skilled migration. And last October, an additional eight categories were made eligible for general employment uh, permits. The construction industry itself plays a very central role in attracting employees into the sector. And there are a range of initiatives being rolled out to promote construction related careers at both primary and secondary level, as well as making resources available to schools, such as um, the Construction Industry Federation Schools Challenge and Engineers Week. Actions are also taking place to promote the take up of apprenticeships and opportunities for professional development, for upskilling and for reskilling. Just to conclude, uh, Housing for All has a focus on sustainability and regulation, which ensures that the homes that we build will remain long after the crisis has been solved. Well-built, secure and sustainable homes are the beating heart of Housing for All. The central goal of our plan Housing for All is that everyone and I mean everyone in the state, should have access to a home to purchase or rent at an affordable price, which is built to a high standard, is built in the right place, and offers a high quality of life. And although the future is often uncertain, I hope the measures outlined reassure you that Housing for All is the comprehensive plan that is needed to tackle the housing crisis. Construction is happening, and the promising level of commencements and completions illustrate uh, the progress that is being made right now. Completions are up, commencements are up, and all of the statistics show that we're moving in the right direction, even in these tough times. This government recognizes the scale of the issue and the very real effect the crisis is having on families right across the country. And the actions that we've set out in Housing for All show that my department and the government as a whole are committed to delivering uh, homes that cater for everyone's need. The breadth of ambition in the plan will help to stop and reverse the decline in home ownership and break the rent trap that so many people are caught in. It'll ramp up state building of social homes uh, to help eliminate homelessness and to really address the waiting lists that are there. It's a plan for everyone and one that lives up to its name. Just as our own nation share a long storied and cultural history, we want to not only continue this into the future, but expand and cultivate our unique relationships. By promoting trade and business and cultural links, we can share the knowledge and experiences learned from our past to ensure a more prosperous shared future for both our countries. And uh, back to you, Jackie. Thanks very much again for having me. Gosh, Ambassador McKee, thank you very much indeed for those very kind words and for your support. Minister, with housing a significant challenge in many EU countries, I think the policies and actions you have taken should indeed help companies make informed decisions as to why they should consider Ireland for their expansion footprint. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to a progression report and uh, hopefully a discussion next year in 2023. And now back to Canada with Deirdre Moore and Country Manager with IDA. Deirdre is based in Toronto, where she works with a portfolio of large enterprise technology consumer and business service companies, from high growth startups to well established multinationals. Deirdre moved from uh, San Francisco a number of years ago to set up IDA's office here in Canada in 2019, bringing with her a wealth of experience from the US market. Deirdre, can you tell us about IDA and how you help companies looking to expand? Well, thank you very much, Jackie, and thanks to you in the Chamber for inviting IDA to be part of the conversation today. Given the impact of inward investment on the Irish economy, I've been asked to talk about the work that IDA Ireland does here in Canada and globally to attract overseas companies into Ireland and, and how we support them. So I've prepared a few slides and for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about IDA and the services that we provide to our clients. Uh, I'll give you a sense of the impact that those companies have on the Irish economy. Um, and I'd also like to give you a flavour of the breadth of considerations that companies have when choosing a location. Uh, much of today's conversation has been around housing and government policy, and this does come up. 
But you'll see it's one of many, many items that companies assess when they're looking to, to stand up in a new location. Um, delighted to be joined by one of our, our great Canadian clients uh, and also a good friend at this stage, Michael Prendergast from Bathfitter. Uh, he's been through this entire process himself um, and is going to share firsthand that experience. So, so really looking forward to that. So I'm going to share slides and hope that that comes across uh, smoothly. Great, OK. So as Jackie says, my name is Deirdre Moran. I'm the country lead for IDA Ireland here in Canada. I moved here three years ago to set up the office. Uh, it's a small office, it's just two of us, um, and, and I'll share myself and Mark Shorten's contact details later uh, today. Um, and just for those of you who don't know, IDA is an Irish government agency uh, funded by, by the government, and we're responsible for the attraction and retention of overseas companies into Ireland. We have three key goals as an agency. Um, one of them, and particularly a big part of our overseas network, is to win new business. So we're always looking to identify new companies and new growing sectors and win mobile investments from within those companies and sectors. Um, we also work very closely with our existing portfolio of clients. We have over 1,700 companies that we support, um, and we're always working with them in Ireland to help them grow and innovate and add new functions in Ireland, adding R&D, upskilling existing employees, and essentially embedding them further in the economy. And, and the last piece of what we do, and it's a big part of what we do, we survey our clients every year or every two years um, around areas that impact their ability to be successful. So skills and education is a big piece of it. Are we putting out the right graduates? Um, we look at regulation, taxation, infrastructure, anything that impacts their ability to be successful in Ireland. And we want Ireland to remain you know, top of our game in all these areas. Um, we've been doing this for over 70 years, uh, not me personally, um, and we've been quite successful as an agency where, we're in, you know, in, in the last 10 years, we've seen consistent growth within our portfolio. Uh, in 2011 or so, we had about 150,000 people employed by our clients. Today, that's over 275,000 people. Uh, those companies spe spend all, over 27 billion euros, sorry, 27 billion euros in the Irish economy every year. Um, and they are responsible for exports of over 290 billion euros. So massive, massive impact. Um, and it's why we have an agency dedicated to supporting these companies. Um, this is, slide is just to show the breadth of sectors that we, you know, that we work with and, and where we focus. Um, we've been lucky that a lot of these sectors have been very resilient throughout COVID. Uh, so essentially we work with, uh, we have a large life, life sciences portfolios. So uh, portfolios, so companies in the medtech, biopharma and pharma space uh, from Canada. That includes the likes of Bosch Health, uh, who make contact lenses. They're down in Wexford. We have uh, a large financial services portfolio. So from Canada, again, that includes the likes of TD Securities, RBC, Sun Life and so on. Um, we have a large enterprise technology team um, and those companies find everything from cybersecurity, semiconductors, right through to different types of SaaS. Uh, from Canada, that includes the likes of BlackBerry, TELUS, OpenText and so on. We also have a team dedicated to consumer tech and business services. So. So that would include companies like Uber, Airbnb, Google, LinkedIn, and again, from Canada, the likes of Shopify, uh, who have a large presence there. And I'll touch on them a little bit later. And then finally, we have a team that works with our industrial uh, engineering and green or clean tech companies. Um, and that includes the likes of Siemens and ABNB, ABB, Vallejo, uh, Lufthansa. And from Canada, that includes the likes of Brookfield and uh, Magna Automotive, who have a manufacturing operation playing over 400 people. So very, very broad uh, sectors. And just to hone in on the Canadian ones, um, we have you know, a relatively small but growing portfolio of Canadian clients. When we decided to open this office back in 2018, we had about 40 Canadian companies employing about 4,000 people. At the time, we were seeing increased interest from the Canadian market. Some of that was driven by Brexit. Some of that was driven by CETA. But essentially, it was time to establish a presence here and, and, and better service our clients. Um, and today we have 61 Canadian clients in our portfolio. They employ over eight and a half, almost uh, almost eight and a half thousand people. So significant growth over the last number of years. This is um, these numbers are from 2021. Um, the numbers are up 10 percent on the prior year, which is fantastic, given it was uh, right at the start of COVID. Um, six of the top 10 Canadian companies by revenue of an operation in Ireland three of the top five Canadian banks, four of the top five Canadian software companies. So we have some of the heavy hitters across the different sectors. Um, almost two thirds are from Ontario. Um, and just to, to comment that there is 
there are more than 60 odd Canadian companies in Ireland. IDA can only support companies that have a um, an export mandate. So they're not just there for the domestic market. And we also work with companies that we can only onboard them when they have a, I suppose, when there's a minimum size. So some of our, com- some Canadian companies might have a handful of people that we just can't onboard yet, but we will certainly work with them and support them until they, until they hit those criteria. So the Irish Canadian Business Association uh, reckons that there's nearer 80 Canadian companies employing about 15,000 people. So just to touch on some of the triggers, or sorry, some of the, the, the key um, considerations that these that influence where, where, where companies uh, decide to set up um, operations. I would say that, you know, these vary by sector. Um, they vary by function in terms of what the company is looking to do. Are they looking at manufacturing? Are they looking at services? Are they looking at software development? So we compete with different locations based on the type of project that a company is looking to, to set up. But there are commonalities across sectors and, and project. Um, the number one thing that we discuss on a day-to-day basis, uh, that's both here in Canada and, and around the world, is talent. Um, access to and availability of talent is one of the key drivers for these decisions. Um, if you can't get, the, or if a company can't get the people that it needs to do what it is they need them to do, you know, what's what's the point? The flexibility of the workforce is very important. The adaptability of the workforce. They look at, you know, the experience um, of other companies. What's the education system like? So it's 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 one of the you know key areas that we focus on in terms of selling Ireland, and we do quite well in it. Um, the second piece is the ability to scale. So this, so a company can come in and set up fairly, fairly easily. But you know, after the initial couple of hires, if I get to ten, um, are able are, are able to to reach that scale. Um, Ease of doing business, uh, very important. Um, the legal system, do, do does the legal system, do they talk to each other? Is it easy to set up there? Is it aligned with the HQ location? Uh, finance and banking, very important. How difficult is that? You know, are there tax advantages? How easy is it to, you know, run your payroll? Um, so again, that's all very important to uh, potential investors. Incentives, very, you know, a lot, a lot of companies are keen to obviously offset some of the costs of these decisions. So they're looking at grants and supports and R&D tax credits. Again, Ireland does quite well there. Infrastructure, again, so based on, on this morning's conversation, infrastructure is absolutely important. It's broader than just housing. They're looking at office space. They're looking at remote working infrastructure, particularly in today's world. You know, does, our, does Ireland or does, does the country we're looking at have the capacity to support um, uh, home workers? Um, you know, what's the broadband like? Uh, can people, you know, can people connect when they're working remotely? So that's, that's key as well. Um, and finally, you know, just to touch on the last point there, is there a good supply of experienced local service providers? So a lot of these companies, don't, they don't want to do everything themselves. They want to work with advisors, recruiters, accountants, uh, lawyers, um, office service, service to office providers that are used to working with international companies and dealing with the different requirements that they might have. So that is key uh, in terms of assessing, assessing locations. And obviously they look at cost and, and other various, various aspects too. And so, you know, Ireland, Ireland does very well. Um, we do, I always say that, you know, companies will look at a lot of different parameters. Uh, there's probably 10 or 15 that they will look at when they're making an assessment. And Ireland does pretty well. We might not be number one in every in every item, but we're usually featuring in the top three. Um, we're consistently voted one of the best countries in the world to do business. We have consistent policies across political parties, uh, usually quite pro-business. Um, we're second in the world for investment incentives. We have a 12.5% corporate tax rate. Very good R&D tax credit system, similar to the shred here in Canada. Uh, very open to immigration. That is more and more important to companies as other countries close their borders. Uh, Canada does well in that in that respect too, but also um, Ireland in terms of speed and we have no caps on work permits. Um, we have the fifth highest international workforce in the EU, which is which is amazing. If you you know thirty years ago that was certainly not the case. Um, from an education perspective, we have the third le- sorry the highest third level attainment in the EU. So almost 60% of Irish, um, the Irish population has a third level, has third level education versus about 40% across the EU average. We have the highest number of STEM graduates, so uh, science and technology graduates per capita in the EU, which is which is a fantastic uh, stat. And our population growth is five times the EU average. So we have a young, growing, well-educated uh, workforce, which is, is you know, hugely attractive in today's world where, where, where talent is is probably the the, mo- the rarest commodity. 
Uh, we're also quite an innovative country where we, we feature in the top 10 most innovative countries in the EU. Um, in our portfolio, in the IDA supported companies alone, in the last uh, five years, people working in R&D roles has increased by 55%. So that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic uh, uh, growth. And then finally, and it's, you know, cannot be understated, um, our, the access to the EU is hugely important. You know, we've won a number of projects uh, off the back of Brexit. Other countries did too, but I think Ireland was probably the most, um, uh, you know, did, did, did best in that situation in terms of inward investment. Um, we're one of the most pro-EU countries in the EU. Our, our, our population is overwhelmingly supportive of it. And we're the only, because of Brexit, we are now the only English speaking member of the EU and of the Eurozone. So again, all of those things, very, very attractive to inward investors. Um, and it's it's why we continue to, to do as well as we do in terms of winning uh, inward investment. So finally, just to touch on some of the services that we provide. So, you know, we do a lot of outreach. We're we're working with companies that may not even be thinking about expansion at the time, but we're, we're positioning Ireland always at an early stage. This is what, what, what the economy looks like. This is what the workforce looks like. And these are the supports that we provide. These are the clusters that exist there. You know, do you know your peers are there? Your clients are there? So we're always kind of, I suppose, positioning it. But then as a company goes through the process, we have a range of supports, both practical and financial, that helps them, uh, uh, you know, get 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 to that, to, to, to the end result in terms of setting up an office. So we do a lot of case studies and peer introductions access into the government system in terms of regulation, uh, you know, uh, anything around, uh, as, as I said, influencing policy. Um, we do a, you know, we introduce them into universities in terms of a graduate pipeline. Uh, we bring them over for fact finding visits. In fact, they travel themselves and we support them on that. We put together these programs for them where they can get the best use of their time. Uh, we help them with all the information gathering and analysis. We also have a range of funding programs in terms of employment and R&D grants. We help them with PR and media for hiring purposes. We help them with employment permits, uh, ensuring that the process is as smooth as possible. So really, and also with property solutions. Um, IDA is one of the biggest landowners in the country. And, uh, you know, having these, you know, ready to go uh, property solutions, again, key advantage and makes us that bit faster in terms of, of setting up than other locations. And then I was going to touch a little bit on, on, on uh, given I'm talking to the chamber here in Ottawa, uh, one of the, you know, I suppose big success stories from Ottawa is Shopify, which is a fantastic reference for, uh, for, for, for us in IDA and broad, like, sorry, in Canada, but also broadly within our kind of broader tech sector, Shopify is, is a great reference. And also a very interesting uh, case study in terms of the approach they took to their international expansion. So Ireland was their first international office outside of the US and Canada. So and, and they were, you know, they were growing super fast. This is back about eight or nine years ago. Um, they had about 500 people at the time um, and they were growing internationally. They needed customer support people in, in, in Europe. They needed them to speak English. They also needed some multilingual support. They wanted them to be closer to the customers from a time zone and a language perspective. They looked at a number of locations, including Ireland, supported by ourselves, and ultimately chose the west of Ireland to set up a 50 person uh, customer support team. They decided to go fully remote to begin with, which was quite unusual at the time. It's less, less unusual than anything, you know, uh, post-COVID. And they decided to, though, to, to, to cluster those people in the west of Ireland so they could have meetups and build a culture, which is, which is a, you know, a very important thing to do right. Um, at the, uh, particularly when you're standing up an office in a new country, you know, you want to build connections between, between your people. Shopify did it very well in terms of having that proximity. Um, however, as they grew and their business grew, they ended up hiring all across Ireland. Very interestingly, they have they have people in every county in the country. Um, and today they are much broader than customer support. They have about 30 plus different functions. They do sales and marketing. They do finance, HR, back office. They have engineers. So they have the whole gambit and they have over 850 people today in Ireland and continue to hire. So a really great reference and um, you know, delighted to be able to, to, to work with them and support them as they grow. So with that, I, I think I'm going to hand back to you, Jackie, and uh, I know you're going to introduce Michael, who's going to share his experience, another great example and a great client for us. And I'll leave you with uh, both mine and Mark's contact details. And please get in touch if you want any more detail, any more sectoral info. Indeed, if you have any connections that are interested in learning more about setting up offices in Ireland or uh, you yourself uh, are interested, it uh, gives a shout at any stage. We're both based in Toronto, but travel all the time and more than happy to connect for a coffee or over uh, over the phone at any point. And thank you very much again for, for having us along today.
Deirdre, as you say, ID identifies infrastructure as one of the key considerations when companies are looking to expand their operations, and housing is indeed an element of that infrastructure. Um, just looking at my notes here, you mentioned that IDA has over 1,700 companies in its portfolio and is enjoying consistent growth, so that bodes very well for the Irish economy, and one could say secures IDA's innovation and growth to service its customers now and into the future. So congratulations to all. I know you're spread all over the world, but uh, that's a, a tremendous achievement. And thank you for the introduction to IDA's customer, Bassfitter. Bassfitter took its company to Ireland, and we had an earlier recording with Michael in Limerick. And we asked Michael if he would tell us um, about the journey from, uh, for Bassfitter from Canada to Ireland, uh, what factors were considered when uh, looking for the location, the first European location, and also within Ireland, why Limerick? Um, what is special about Limerick and what did Limerick have to offer above other regions in Ireland, in your opinion? And also the benefits of working with IDA, how they helped you, and some tips and top lessons. So we'll now go to the recording from Michael at Bath Theatre. Hi, good afternoon, folks. My name is Michael Prendergast. I'm the Vice President of Bath Fitter Limited for Europe. Want to first of all uh, thank very much the Ireland and Canada Chamber uh, for inviting me to speak on uh, this video webinar, as well as uh, IDA, the Irish Development Association, uh, Deidre Moran, who extended the offer. Thank you very much for this gracious opportunity to allow me to speak to you folks. A couple of things that uh, wanted to talk about today was some of the journeys that uh, we made from basically Canada to Europe, uh, some of the decisions that we made, what were some of the factors, um, how did we pick Limerick, for example, benefits of working with the IDA and, and so on. So with that, uh, definitely for those of you who don't know Bathfitter, uh, we are a North American based company. We're actually a multinational now with our European location set up. We have 287 locations throughout North America. Uh, Limerick, Ireland is our first location uh, within the EU. Uh, when we looked at uh, our journey from Canada to Ireland, it was a decision that we had made uh, approximately four and a half years ago, started looking at uh, the opportunities that existed in Europe and would our product fit into the European market. Uh, as a result of this, we reached out to IDA, uh, who has been a, a tremendous partner, ally and source for us looking at uh, locations coming into uh, Ireland. When we looked at uh, the locations, IDA does an excellent job or has done an excellent job for Bathfitter. Basically, they have uh, quite a few set geographical locations. We were looking for a very specific type of property. Uh, about 7,000 square feet is what we were looking at. IDA had uh, sourced quite a few for us, uh, myself and uh, our director of uh, retail operations and locations uh, traveled over here, spent uh, about a week, a uh, week and a half with IDA touring from Dublin, uh, up to Dundalk, uh, over to Galway, uh, down into the Cork area. And quite frankly, when we looked at the, the locations, they did source a fabulous building for us here in Limerick. When we looked at uh, the employees, when we looked at looking at potential skill set, skill levels, uh, Limerick kept you know coming up as a great location to be considered looking at. One of the things that we did uh, consider is ge geographical terms and, and areas. When you look at Ireland and the, the distance that we can travel, I mean, we can get up to the north of the country into Belfast, for example, in three and a half, three hours, 45 minutes, we can get down to Cork in an hour and a half. We can get to Dublin in two and a half hours. So very conveniently located. And I think the biggest thing was the skill set, the skill set of the people here uh, in Limerick. Uh, IDA introduced us to the local government, uh, the local council, which was a great asset uh, as we continued uh, to move forward. I think one of the things as you folks look to or venture down uh, the potential opportunity to base yourselves in, in, in Ireland, number one, it's, it's a great country. Uh, people are very open, uh, very business mindset uh, when you look at this this country to set up a location, very easygoing and not complicated folks to deal with. When you look at our friends from the IDA, uh, I'll tell you, they, they are an amazing partner. I mentioned it early on in my introduction. 
IDA has been uh, an asset for us. Uh, they have a list of clients. They have a list of opportunities. They know the ins and out to business. And again, you know, understanding that their, their main role is to bring you into this country and to help you basically be successful in your business. When we looked at IDA, um, you know, we looked at banking institutions, we looked at accounting institutions, we looked at solicitors. IDA has a great reference of people. Now, IDA are not going to point to one or the other. They're going to give you a bank of information. It's up to you as, as potential folks coming to Ireland is to do the research, to look at the folks that they're recommending. But I can assure you that the, the, the recommendations from IDA are outstanding. I can tell you that, you know, we set up a plant in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, without a doubt, in, in the, our U.S. operation, our Canadian operation is in Montreal. We've gone through these these networks. We've gone through these folks that, that, that come out and, and, you know, are supportive or are there. I'll tell you, IDA backs up. They walk the walk and talk the talk. And I think that's the greatest uh, recommendation or comments that I can make on the IDA. Lessons learned. Um, there haven't been that many roadblocks or pitfalls. Uh, having the access to the IDA has been great. Uh, would we do anything different? Probably not. Uh, again, everything that you're doing is it's a learning curve. I think, you know, some of the things that need to be taken into account if you're considering coming over to Ireland to start up the business, folks, quite frankly, is we think we speak the same language. We don't. You're in a different culture, you're in a different part of the world, and it is. It may be a small island, but I'll tell you, folks, it is very different. So biggest recommendation for me would look to source local folks. It's great if you're going to move people over, but again, you're in a different country, you're in a different culture. Our lads here are phenomenal. Uh, they speak the language, they, they, and it's, it's English, folks. Don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying, but there's just different nuances that exist. Uh, our brochures, for example... We had to have translated, as, as odd as that sounds, we had to translate from English to English, but it's an English that's well-spoken and understood in Ireland. There, there, there's analogies, to give you an example, we do a bath over a bath. Well, you know, when you look at bath over a bath, that doesn't exist. A bath or a tub here is very, very different. They're, they're looking at jacuzzi tubs, which is not our market and what we do. So that would definitely be um, a word of advice or a piece of advice I'd, I'd lend to all of you looking at coming over here. Um, and that's really it. I think that, uh, again, I want to certainly thank, uh, Ireland and, uh, the Canada chamber, uh, for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you to IDA for, again, this, this invitation to, to take part in this. And I wish you all the best of luck. If you're looking to this country, it's a great footpath. It's a great stepping stone into the EU. You know, folks, the last thing I'll say is, you know, people ask why Ireland? Very simple. When we made the decision, uh, four years ago, Ireland was the last speaking country within the EU. Uh, Brexit was happening and we sort of, and I'm not getting into that political quagmire conversation, but it was one of the things that we looked at when we came here. So again, folks, best of luck. Thanks again for allowing me this opportunity to speak in front of you and have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. And that was Michael Prendergast, VP EMEA at Bowsitter, coming to us from the beautiful Limerick. That concludes our session for today. I take this opportunity to thank Ambassador McKee for his unwavering support and I am deeply honoured by your gracious words, Ambassador. After 12 years with ICOT, I move at the end of this year to help build the new Ireland Canada Business Council, together with my colleagues Paul Dan in Montreal and Carmel Drummage in Toronto and will be expanding beyond that next year. I'm also very excited uh, for my new venture, We Are Global Irish. We hope you found today's session informative and that you enjoyed it. If you have any ideas for subject matter or specific speakers you would like to hear from, please let us know and drop us a line for your contact details and the information below. Until next time, be well, we'll see you. Thank you. Go ahead.